Hi, I'm, my name is Jim Pelmeri. I've been playing Frisbee since 1970. I enjoyed it very much, and I became fascinated with its history. Where did it come from? How, how did the, all these Frisbee sports develop? Yeah, and I uh, started doing some research, and now I'm writing a book about it. So, and I found out a lot of things. It turns out that from the beginning of time, when the human being became somewhat aware of their surroundings, whenever there was a disc-like object mounted, a, a, a cardboard top, a cookie tin lid, and even before that, whatever, somewhere, sometime, somebody picked them up and swung it out and noticed that it flew pretty neat. They had a cookie tin, and somehow, and they said, wow, look at that. Let me try that, whoever saw it. And they found it was fun. And so they played catch with it. Nobody thought much beyond it. That's fun, it's a fun thing to do. And the items were cardboard ice cream tops. You've seen these big five gallon cardboard ice cream tops. They're just there. But lo and behold, they fly as good as a lot of commercial production frisbees today. Same flight pattern. Uh, significant in this was a popcorn candle. 1939, Fred Morrison was at his uh, fiance's family's Thanksgiving dinner. His fiance's brother brought some popcorn in a big tin. And somehow, somewhere, somebody tossed that popcorn lid. Blue kind of nice. Fred Morrison was fascinated with it. He said, hey, let me try that. And he was playing catch with the brother-in-law, or the too soon-to-be brother-in-law. And he asked him if he could take that lid home with him. And he said, yes. And so Fred played with that quite regularly. He found it was a fun recreational activity, just like we do with our friends. It was fun, so we do it. It was fun for him. Well, that got beat up, then it and you know, went to pot. So he was looking for a replacement and he found a cake tin. A cake tin. Who would think? A cake tin. Yeah, watch how a cake tin flies. Can't get much better than that. Cake tin was a nickel. It cost him a nickel for a cake tin. He bought a supply of cake tin. One day, he's on a beach. And he's playing with his, uh, I think it was his wife at that time. They had gotten married. And a guy came over and said, Oh, that looks like fun. He says, Look, I'll give you a quarter for that cake tin. And Fred quickly put together, I paid a nickel. I can get a quarter for it. Hey, Fred Morrison was an entrepreneur and he decided he's going to try to market some cake tins. So he, uh, oh! Brought cake tins out, did demos on the beaches and stuff like that. I don't know the exact details. He's got a book out you can read about it. And uh, he then thought, you know, if we can make this out of a suitable material, it's cheap and, and uh, better than metal, we might be able to have a sellable item. And he came up with, after years of development, the Pipco Flying Saucer. Little Abner brought special promotion he did. And this was his first flying, so this was the first plastic flying disc designed and made to sell for recreational fleet. Now, amongst, you know, Fred Morrison wasn't the only person to discover that it was fun. Uh, high pants from all over the place were also flung around. They don't fly as good as cake tins, but they do fly. Now, one of the pie pan companies, one of the pie companies was in uh, Connecticut, Bridgeport, Connecticut, the Frisbee Pie Pan. And you can see, it's got the huge Frisbee written right on the, the tin. And that's right next to Yale University. Yale University was not exempt from discovering lids and 
just see by him fly. They, they were somewhat of a fad in the 40s and the 50s playing with these things. And amongst the things they were playing with was the Frisbee Pie Company oh, yeah. pie cans. And that's where the name came from. Oh, this flinging activity started to get called Frisbee. Frisbee. And it was spelled all kinds of ways. Because nobody knew. You know, I heard the word Frisbee. It was F R I Z B E, F R I S B I E. The Frisbee Pie Company was I E. You know, nobody really knew. But the sound, that's all that counts. At any rate, Fred Morrison wasn't the only one to do the exact same concept. Bill Robes in uh, Etna, New Hampshire was flinging around cherry candles, just like the lids I had. A tin lid, and it flew nice. And he decided to make a plastic model and thought he could sell them just like Fred Morrison. And it called it the Space Saucer. But when he took it to the college bookstores, they labeled it the Frisbee thing, buy this Frisbee thing, because that's what people knew it. The Space Saucer name never caught on. So, Fred Morrison finally hooked up with Whammo. Whammo decided, yeah, yeah. Well, first, Fred didn't like the way this thing flew. It didn't flew quite as well as his team. He retooled it into the Poodle Platter. All right, this is the Poodle Platter. See, right down the center there, Pluto Platter. He called the Pluto Platter. When he sold it to Whammo, Whammo found out about the word Frisbee being associated with flying discs, and they decided to name their Pluto Platter the Frisbee Pluto Platter. And that's how the Frisbee came into being in terms of the name. So, and that's flew better than the uh, Bill Rhodes hooked up with Parker Brothers, the Monopoly people, and he was on the verge of making a very nice, tidy business deal. Parker Brothers told him they wanted to change his disc a little bit. And he was a stubborn New Englander, and he said, no way. And I got this straight from the words of Bill Rhodes himself. He told me the story. This is not an apocryphal story at all. This is a real true story. He says, I wouldn't see it. I wouldn't have it. I said, no way. No deal. I don't want the deal if you're going to change it. And they said, okay. So, it was approximately the same period of time that, uh, that actually, that was a little bit earlier than, than uh, Ro, uh, Morrison went to Whammo. So, Morrison hit it big because Whammo eventually parlayed the Frisbee item into a big sell. But it was bumpy road until it got there. And there's a story behind that that's out of scope for now. But you can see that in the book I'm writing. Uh, so the space saucer went into obscurity. The Pluto platter stayed and got retooled into the Pro Model by Ed Hedrick in 1964. The Pro Model, the Pro Model, became the standard sport model disc and that was what was available when disc sports became be, began to uh, come into being and it was the, the basic disc so that was that was basically where the concept began in 1958 I'm gonna walk back over to get this food <laughs> A guy by the name of Jake Healy bought one of these things at the University of Michigan. He was at law school there. And he had fun with it, played games with it. And he went home and got married. And at his wedding reception, and again, this is straight from Jake Healy himself, not, not a pocket. This is the words right from Jake Healy. They played a game that was guts like, and they enjoyed it, and they and he didn't go to his uh, his uh, honeymoon that night. He stayed home for a week because they had, for whatever reasons, and during that week, they developed the game of guts. And they thought it was fun. And the 
they had a family uh, birthday party for his brother on Labor Day weekend, 1958, and they had a match and they called himself. They called themselves the North Central Frisbee Team, and they took on all challengers for their friends. You know, they got the, and they won. And they were the champions. The next year at their annual Fourth of July picnic that they had every year from who knows how when, but they they said, hey, let's play that frisbee game again. And so they did, and they won that one too. In 1960, the third year after that, they began to realize they have a little tradition, and that's a lot of fun, and they expanded it and made it more detailed. They made it more official. They had they had an uh, accuracy event. They had a uh, uh, little bugs here, by the way. That's why I'm swatting. Uh, and they, uh, for the kids, age groups, and the adults, accuracy, distance, and then the guts game. And it became so much fun that they put a big deal into it and they started, started uh, tongue-in-cheek, facetious type promotions uh, about that. And they started up what they called the International Frisbee Association and their tournament was being called the International Frisbee Tournament, the IFT. And it turns out that it was very propitious that they were doing this in such a big way. And they were getting teams from Chicago and uh, Minnesota, all of the upper peninsula, peninsula of Michigan. Word of mouth was spreading to the, these people. Let's play this game. It was all really friends and, and acquaintances, but yet it was spreading. Somehow, they I, they communicated with Whammo at the time that Ed Hedrick started. And it, it was right at the juncture when Whammo was looking at the low sales of this little letter right thinking, eh, you know, and another item they had in the market, the turbo tube, they decided, we got to figure out which, what we're going to cut out. So they cut the turbo tube out, Frisbee was on the chopping block, but Ed found out about this stuff in, in the upper peninsula of Michigan, and he said, guys, give me a chance, I think I can do something with this Frisbee guy. And it had it not been for the guts game that Jake Healy and his brother started, we may not have the first They may have cut it out and it's gone, and then there will be nobody for other companies to emulate, and who knows, we still might be throwing our tin lids in our cardboard cans. That's all conjecture, we don't know what would have happened, but it certainly was the reason that the Frisbee stayed and things evolved from there. Very, very important little junction. And the guts, so the guts game is actually the grandfather game. It was the first organized Frisbee sport. And from 1958 to 1968, it was a localized little gathering up in the Upper Peninsula. Word of mouth spread, mostly friends that all knew each other that came every year. And it's a once a year thing. Then, Ed Hedrick thought, hey, this International Frisbee Association is here. I think that could be a good promotion. How about let me run that? And I guess the Healy brothers said, okay, I don't know the details of how that transacted, but Whammo started the International Frisbee Association, and Ed Hedrick conceived of the International Frisbee Association newsletter, the IFA newsletter. That is, by all means, the very beginning of the development of the Frisbee sport. Because now, everybody who Join. They had a big promotion in their package. 50% join the International Frisbee Association. Get the International Frisbee Association newsletter. People who were interested did that. They read about these things. They found out about the guts in the upper peninsula. And they started going themselves, getting teams together to go compete in this thing. And that's when the sport started to go. People started talking about it. Now you have, other than local friends and stuff like that, you have the general public learning about prison. So up until 1973, there was no organized disc sports whatsoever other than the basic guts community that was there and the fledgling, rapid growing ultimate, which had got started a completely different offshoot, but still linked because they had the frisbee to do it with. If there was no frisbee, that ultimate never would have started either. So those two were the organized Sports, there was no disc golf. There was no MTA. There was no nothing yet. 
disc golf was around. People played disc golf. There was no organized sport of disc golf. And same thing with all the others. No overall terms. There was nothing. 1974 was the beginning of the organized sports. Dan Roddick organized the Octane. The first overall tournament. Eight events. I'm going to play all eight events and keep points and see who did the best. And then there was a very big disc golf tournament that you can, uh, uh, well, if you get the PDGA magazine that's coming up, you'll see an article about the 1974 American Flying Disc Open. That'll give you a little rundown of how disc golf got started as a sport. But to keep the record straight, disc golf was played in 1926 with tin lids. People well, had tin lids in a group. In 1926, a group of kids in Canada played a game they called tin lid golf. Apparently, one of the kids' fathers must have played golf. And they were playing tin lid catch like we do with our frisbees. They were no different than anybody else. They invented games and did things. And they discovered they could play golf with their discs, with their tin lids. And what do they need? Tin lid golf, and that's what they're using. Why do we name it frisbee golf when we first started playing golf with a frisbee? Because it says frisbee on the damn thing. You know, so that, that's just how the naming goes. And then when Whammo was protecting their trademark, and they actually uh, uh, refused to allow me to use the term United States Frisbee Championship uh, and Frisbee Golf as part of my tournament in 1974. They said, you can't use our, our name. And they said, if you don't comply, we'll have to bring legal proceedings. That was going away. I thought when I approached them with my proposal that they would be happy. I, I so I called it the American Flying Disc Open. And for that tournament, we called it Flying Disc Golf. And Dan Roddick, in his uh, his uh, Flying Disc World newsletter that he just started that year, called it Disc Golf. And Disc Golf may be key. So that basically is the background story of where Frisbee sports came from. And I'm primarily in all of my book, get a lot of detail. So when it comes out, hopefully by the middle of next year, you can read about it there. Thank you for your time. My time.